now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Well, here it is, the very final episode of the original Golden Age of Radio, the final episode of Suspense that came out of New York City, an episode of Suspense, September 30th, 1962, that aired at 6.35 that Sunday evening. It's entitled, Devilstone. And now, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. In a moment, Act One of Devil Stone, starring Christopher Carey and Neil Fitzgerald, and written especially for Suspense by Jonathan Bundy. My name is Martin, Timothy Martin. I live here in Dublin, and very nicely, too, thanks to a considerable inheritance and sale of the family estate in County Kilkenny, which bought a very good price. I have a comfortable cottage, a faithful manservant by the name of Everts, and everything else I need to live an easy, contented life, and without the need of applying myself to any sort of labor. Even my financial matters are no bother to me, handled by a penny-pinching old solicitor by the name of Ian Carney. And mine was a contented life. Until, that is. Until a long-forgotten uncle died and left me some property he'd owned but never lived on up in County Fermanagh, near on up in County Fermanagh, near Inniskillen. A place known as Devilstone. And then... But let me digress for a moment. I should say, let me seem to digress for a moment. And remember this, please. For it may have much to do with the strange, terrifying tale I'm about to tell you. Deep under St. Michael's Church, here in Dublin is a crypt. It possesses most amazing properties. In it lie scores of bodies in a state of perfect preservation. Albeit they are hundreds of years old. The old ones used to say it's due to some wondrous form of black magic. Uh, but, But modern science, modern chemistry, has exploded that ancient belief. Has shown that certain gases generated by the unusual composition of the dark, dank earth in which the crypt is located, uh, those gases have produced this amazing phenomenon. Very well. Now, a few days ago, I called Mr. Carney, my solicitor, on the telephone. I've been hoping you'd call me, Timothy. I wish to speak with you about that house and property in County Fermanagh that your uncle left you. Well, I've certainly no desire to move away from Dublin, Mr. Carney, so I've decided to rent out the old place. Rent it out? And why not, sir? You really think you can? Well, I'm quite certain I can. I doubt it. Well, as a matter of fact, an American couple by the name of Stoker left here only yesterday for a look at it. I see. I expect they'll be back here a moment now to agree to lease it for the summer. Timothy, you uh, showed them the pictures and description of the place? Yesterday morning. They were, so, they were so intrigued by them, they were all for signing a lease then and there. You'd better to have taken their money and let them do it, my boy. Oh? Aye. Well, I, I'm sure I don't see why. Well, surely they're entitled to look at the place over before they take it. After all, Mr. Carney, never having been there myself, there wasn't too much I could tell them about Devilstone. Exactly as it should be, Timothy. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand you, sir. I mean that now, my boy. You will never rent it to them. Nor to anyone else who goes there. Why not? Now, why do you say that, Mr. Carney? Well? You... You don't know? Well, of course I don't know. Then perhaps your tenants... I should say erstwhile prospective tenants will tell you. If you ever see them again. Uh, now, what do you mean by... Oh, excuse me a moment, Mr. Carney. Uh, yes, what is it, Everts? Uh, I beg your pardon, sir, but there's a Mr. Stoker here to see you. Stoker? Yes, sir. And if I may say so, he appears to be quite excited about something uh, rather angry. Hello? Shall I tell him you're busy and suggest he see you another time? Timothy? Yes? Uh, no, Everts. Have him come in, please. Very good, sir. Hello, hello, Timothy. Oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Carney, but I have someone here to see me. Uh, Now, about Devilstone, Timothy. I I think I'd better call you back. Very well, if you like. But there is something about Devilstone, its history, 
That you might not be cognizant of. I will. I'll get back to you shortly. Timothy. Uh, goodbye, sir. Well, at least you didn't try to skip out on me. Uh, Mr. Stoker, how are you? Nice to see you again. Oh, it is, eh? Uh, did, did you and your wife get over to look at Devilstone as you'd planned? We certainly did. And by heaven, Martin, if this is your idea of some practical joke... My what? Sending me alone to that ungodly place would have been bad enough. But my wife... Martin, you want to be horsewhipped. No, wait, please. Sir. I'll have you know that as a result of your having let her go there, you and your twisted sense of humor... What? What is the matter with you, anyway? The poor woman nearly went out of her mind. Mr. Stoker, I just... She still hasn't recovered from it. Sure, sure, I got her back to Dublin, all right. But the doctor's ordered her to bed. Had to give her strong sedatives... Now, I warn you, young man, if she doesn't recover... Now, I'll just admit, Mr. Stoker... Oh, don't bother, Martin. The less you say, the less I have to see of you from here on out, the better. Here. Here are the keys to that... that place. Now, look here, Mr. Goodbye, Martin. If I ever see you again, it will be in a court of law. Now, believe me, Mr. Stoker, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you so upset about? Oh, you don't, eh? Do you mean to say there's something... something wrong with Devilstone? And do you mean to say that you, the owner of it, don't know... You don't know what, sir? You don't know that that ungodly place is haunted? What? You heard me. Haunted! Could I possibly have heard right, sir? Haunted? Was well, that what he said, Mr. Martin? Haunted? Yes, that's what he said. Oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. But really, really, it's too amusing. It's perfectly all right, Everts. You go right ahead and laugh, and I'll join you. Well, that's about an absurd excuse I've ever heard. Excuse me, sir. You don't think he meant it. But the devil's own is haunted? How could he? Haunted houses went out of fashion a hundred years ago. No, Everts, it was simply a silly excuse for not leasing the place. But now that he and his wife have had a look at it, but what an excuse. But does he think that we Irish are nothing but a lot of stupid, superstitious idiots? Quite right, sir. What? I, I, I mean, of course not, sir. Well, anyhow, it's completely ridiculous. So we'll simply forget it. Forget about the Stokers. Place an advertisement in the papers and find ourselves some other tenants. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe we'd best reduce the rate on it a bit. Perhaps that's what scared them off. No, well, that could be, sir. Or who knows? And perhaps Devilstone isn't in as good condition as we've been led to believe. But can you imagine anyone coming up with an excuse so patently absurd, so completely asinine, and so utterly foolish, and expecting us to believe him, to take him seriously? Yes. What is it, sir? Everts. The truth now. Yes. Do you believe? D do you think? Possibly. Oh, no. No, of course not. It couldn't be. And it... Could that have been what Mr. Carney was talking about? Or at least implying? Mr. Carney, the solicitor? Yes. But Mr. Carney seems to be a man of good sense. He was so definite about it, though. When he told me I should have let them do what they wanted after they saw the pictures, sign a lease immediately. Before they even saw Devilstone? Yes, yes. They would have, you know. They would have signed and paid a couple of months' rent. And Mr. Carney said I was wrong in not letting them do it. In not getting what I could, and immediately. Uh, would, would that would have been... Would it have been completely uh, ethical? No. You mean if something is wrong with the place? But haunted, sir. No, no, of course not. Ridiculous. Oh, of course. And yet... Uh, well, there's one way to find out. Yes. Shall I put in a call to Mr. Carney? No, 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 no. By doing that, I'd be admitting that I might believe in such ridiculous possibility. No, no, Everts. You and I will drive up to Devilstone and we'll investigate ourselves. Capital, sir. A splendid idea. Now, you like it, eh? Well, never having seen the place either of us, and after Mr. Stoker's reaction to it, it might be quite exciting, sir. Uh, let's see now. If we leave right away, we should be able to reach Devilstone by nightfall. Yes, sir. Uh, so watch the car and a couple of flashlights, too. Very good, sir. And perhaps, uh, perhaps I'd better take along a pistol, just in case. And of course. What, sir? Well, uh, to conduct our investigation in the ghostly place and style, we'll take along one of the dogs with us. Say, uh, Red Kim of Hellescoat. An excellent idea, sir. Now let's get underway. Yes, sir. And they'll get underway in a moment. September 30th, 1962, the final episode of Suspense, Devilstone, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You know, it's true. Difficult times have a way of focusing us. We have to think about what matters most when it comes to our spending, our health care. No doubt. This is why so many people are joining MediShare right now. 
MediShare is a trusted way to save up to 50% on your monthly healthcare costs. More than 400,000 people have already made the switch. It's pretty obvious why, too, especially now during this challenging season with healthcare costs and out-of-pocket expenses going up. MediShare can save you a lot of money. The typical family saves $500 a month. And MediShare is a Christian healthcare sharing ministry that's worked beautifully for 29 years. There are different options to choose from to fit your budget. I'll give you the number here in a second. And if you call, you can get a price within two minutes. Maybe now is the perfect time to make the switch and start saving. Here you go. Call 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Unlike many shows that ended their run, CBS made no announcements during the show that these were the final episodes of the show. And that's truly sad. But then at that point in time, they figured that that classic radio or golden age of radio or whatever you want to call it was basically dead. And they didn't want to acknowledge the passing, which is sad. Now more of suspense. Devilstone, September 30th, 1962. Well, Everts, if the man at the petrol station told us right, the random old mansion you now see before you is Devilstone. Yes, I see. Now what kind of a reaction is that? Not a gloomy old place, if I may say so, sir. Now, don't you start conjuring up some ghosts. Even Kim apparently finds nothing particularly friendly about it. Now, look, Evans. If you're going to become superstitious about Devilstone... Oh, no, sir. Come along, we'll have a look at it. Come along, Kim, come along. Boy. <laughs> Now, let me see if I can unlock this door. Yes, sir, here. I'll hold the flash on it for you. Good. Uh, I believe this is the key. Well, the door is already ajar. Why, yes, sir. So I see. Well, come along, you two. Come on, kid. He's protesting rather vehemently, sir. Uh, We'll just get him inside and we'll close the door. Yes, sir. Kim! Uh, what the devil's the matter with you? Oh, come now, boy. Are you a dog or a mouse? He most certainly is frightened of something, sir. Yes. He doesn't look like a ghost hunter crouched down there in the corner that way. And if I remember the pictures correctly, this door here should lead to a small... Oh, Enclosed court, sir. Oh, oh, and my word. Right. Just another night bird, Everts. Don't let it bother you. Now, now do you mind why, telling me why... Well, why did you do that? I beg your pardon? What? Why, you're still over there at the door. And yet... I distinctly felt something or someone bump against my shoulder. And I thought someone walked on past me... Look here, look here, Mr. Martin. Yes? What is it? In the mud, out there in the court. Shine your light on it, sir, where mine is. Why, why, yes. Footprints. But big ones. And fresh. Uh, uh, do, do you see? More of them are being made even as we look at them. Yet there's no one there to make them. The impossible. I, I know, sir. But you're right, Evans. You're right. Go back inside now and quickly. Yes. Now, whatever is making those footsteps can't follow us. It, it, uh, it does feel a bit safer in here. Uh, no wonder Kim is frightened. There are things like that going on. Uh, but why? And how? 
What do you suppose, sir? That one of the old lamps could be lighted. Well, if they have any oil in them. And it shouldn't take us long to find out if they... Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. Now, what are we acting this way for? It's trickery, that's all it is. It's trickery. But by, by whom, sir? And why? Ah, well, that is something we shall have to find out. Now, where is Kim? Oh, there he is, still in the corner. Sick with fright. Do you suppose, sir? No. Nonsense. Now, whoever it was that scared Stoker and his wife out of here is trying to scare us now. And I mean to find him out. Yes, but the dog, sir. And if it's true about them and, and, and that there is a ghost... Nonsense. Now, we'll just look about here. <coughs> Where? Now what's the matter? <coughs> that door. At the other end. What? Behind you. It's opening by itself into a small room beyond. Ah, good. Then we shall start our investigation in that room. Well, uh, are you coming? Uh, yes, sir. Oh! Oh, clumsy. Now you've dropped your flashlight. But I didn't, sir. I didn't. It was knocked out in my hand. It what? Honest. Honest it was, sir. I swear it, sir. Now, Everts, don't be silly. Go on back in there and get it. Well, I, I, I really rather not, sir, if you don't mind. Oh, oh, the door. It's closed by itself. And now we're locked in. Oh, we are, eh? Who did this? Who closed this door? Who's there? Who's there, I say? Same one. What? The same thing. Oh, what are you talking about? The same thing that struck your shoulder, that made the footprints in the mud, and that frightened poor Kim so badly. And frightened you, too. But I say it's trickery. Trickery. It has to be. Who's doing this? Answer me. Answer me. You'd this be gone. Your death begun. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I guess we'd better. Yes, sir. Uh, no, no. Not a bit of it. Please, sir. Please, in the name of heaven, sir. No. We're going to stay right here, Everts, until we find Your out. Your death begun. No, no, no. Not until we learn... Just what's going on and... Where's that voice coming from? I've tried to warn you. Oh, please, sir. They've tried to scare us, that's all. Tried to scare us. Yes. Yes. So that you'd leave this place. Why? Because if you do not, you will suffer the same fate as the dog. Kim? Fate? What are you talking about? Oh, look, sir. The door is open. Yes, look. In the light of the flash that was dropped in there. Kim! Everts. Everts. Kim is dead. Then, Mr. Martin... Oh, please, sir, I, I, I beg of you. Who did this? Who did this? Show yourself. Yes. I will show myself. Look. What? Oh, oh, look, sir. Out, out of thin air. Yes, yes, I see him. Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin. Yes, yes, yes. Please. All right, all right, we'll leave. Come along, Everts. Come on. Yes, 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 Mr. Carney. I thought at first it was trickery or perhaps some kind of joint hallucination by Everts and myself. 
Induced perhaps by the gloomy atmosphere of the old house and whatever it was that Stoker had said about his wife and her being so terrified. No, my boy. Uh, but when it actually happened, that he actually appeared there before us out of thin air, this misty, tenuous, impalpable figure, and then when we found there wasn't so much as a little mark on Kim, the dog, who up to that moment had been as healthy as I. But why didn't you tell me about whatever it is in that, 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 that inhabits that place when I talked to you on the phone? I tried to, Timothy, but you cut me off. And after all, I'd known about it only as a legend from hearsay. And he was a huge man and powerful, this ghost. Yes, I should say it was Jason O'Flynn, your ancestor, who built the place for his wife. It was to have been her castle. Was? Yes. But the first day she sought to enter into it, she fell, tripped upon the threshold, she struck her head, and she never regained consciousness. I see. The doctor was summoned, did all he could for her, there in a smaller room off the main salon. Yes. But she died that night. And then Jason O'Flynn swore by the book that no one would live in that house but he until his body turned to dust. He walked out of that little room then and was never seen again. And ever since that time... But now you know the rest. Wait. Yes? Until his body turns to dust. His own words. And he wasn't seen to leave. No. September 30th, 1962, the final episode of Suspense on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion next. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I shouldn't be surprised that CBS Radio just ignored the passing of old-time radio because CBS television is just as bad. They have a number of old Jack Benny shows that uh, the Jack Benny family has signed off. They're more than willing to let those original shows go to the Jack Benny fan club, but they just won't do it. They, they ignore their history. The conclusion now of Suspense, the final episode of Suspense, September 30th, 1962, Devilstone. What are you thinking of, Timothy? I'm going back there, Mr. Carney. Tomorrow, in daylight. Hmm. I, I, I just don't get it. And I certainly found no signs of hollow walls or hidden panels on the floors above, sir. And yet, Everett, somewhere, somewhere close to that small room. Hmm. Don't you think it's best we simply leave the place and... and, and uh... No, no. No one but he. Could... What? Until his body turned to dust. What, sir? And although there must have been other people about, he wasn't seen to leave. And to me, Everts, that means only one thing. Somewhere in this house lies the key to this mystery. But we've been here most of the day, sir, and we've found nothing. And it's getting on towards dusk. I know, I know, I know. But until I find some... Oh, sorry, sir. Let me help you. The old rug was so badly wrinkled, it's no wonder you tripped. Wait. Heavens. Listen. Very, a very hollow floor, I should say. Here. Help me fold this rug back. Yes, sir. Here now. And look. A sort of trap door. And fitted in the floor so tightly. Yes. And this, it, it looks like a seal around the edge. Why, yes, sir. And a heavy lift and ring. Well, then give me a hand. We'll see if we can raise it. Now. Uh, oh, it's very tight, sir. Yes. Uh, but the seal is giving way a little. Uh, put everything you have into it now. Yes, sir. Uh, Ah, good. We made it. A musty fetid hollowed odor coming up out of that place. Yes. Yes, Everts. Like that in the caves, or the catacombs under St. Michael's. You mean where all the, the, the bodies and, and, and... Yes. Quickly now. The flashlight. Give it to me. Here, sir. Now. Now. Look, 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 look down there on the earthen floor below. Do you see? Do you see? The wrists are cut. He killed himself. No. No, it's he. It's the ghost that we saw. Yes, Everts. The body of Jason O'Flynn. 
and so perfectly preserved as, as though he died only moments ago. Oh, it's horrid. Until his body turned to dust, he said. So we know now, now that we've found it. So please, sir, let's leave this place. Uh, wait, Evans. Wait. What do you see? Now the fresh air has reached it. Oh! Oh, good Lord! Yes. The color is leaving the cheeks. The pallor of death is taking its place. And yes, now, at long last, the body will turn to dust. No longer will Jason O'Flynn walk the night. Requies cut in pace. Suspense. You've been listening to Devil Stone, starring Christopher Carey and Neil Fitzgerald, and written especially for Suspense by Jonathan Bundy. Suspense is produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Heard in tonight's story were Gilbert Mack, Walter Grise, Reynold Osborne, and Frank Milano. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical direction by Fred Cusick. Associate director, Bernie Seabrooks. This is Stuart Met speaking. The final episode of Suspense, September 30th, 1962. Although there would be efforts to revive the golden age of radio through programs such as ABC's Theater 5, the CBS Radio Mystery Theater, the Sears Radio Theater or Mutual Radio Theater, and other programs, they would not have the same quality, the same effort of production, or the same type of feel that the programs that aired before September 30th, 1962 did. And this is no dig on the people who did these later shows, especially considering CBS Radio Theater, Hyman Brown and... Uh, uh, Elliot Lewis uh, at the uh, Mutual Radio Theater, CBS, uh, excuse me, the Mutual Radio Theater, the Sears Radio Theater, they did wonderful jobs. The problem was they cost a lot of money to produce, 30 and 60 minute programs, and the advertising wasn't there to support them. And that was truly sad. The final episode of Suspense that signed off at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, September 30th, 1962, as we pay tribute to the last day of the Golden Age Radio here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. One final word on September 30th, 1962 being the last day of the Golden Age of Radio. We have come so far in the past 10 years, 15, 20 years of technology being able to do amazing things with uh, solid state technology and digital audio and all of that, that if the money was there, we could do classic radio today. And I want to salute the people at Imagination Theater who do some wonderful shows. The problem is they don't do a lot of shows. They do, and they're amateurs, but they do, they, they're not professionals. Let me put it this way. Their money is not totally dependent on it. They produce two to four shows a month, and the shows they do are exceptional. But one couldn't do it today on major radio because, quite frankly, the money's not there, and that is sad. Let's close out this hour of classic radio theater by going to September 30th, 1954, and an episode of Jim and Mary and Jordan in Wistful Vista, Fibber McGee and Molly. It's time for Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Sundays through Thursdays, NBC brings you Fibber, McGee, and Molly transcribed. The show is written by Phil Leslie and Ralph Goodman and directed by Max Hutto.
If you're in downtown Wistful Vista at lunchtime, the place to go is Walt's Malt Shop at 14th and Oak. The service is good, prices are moderate, and the food is recommended by Walt himself. Order! Burger on a bun. Hold the onions. Hurry our order, will you, Cor? I'm starving. You're always starving, Doc. My gosh, the look you give a hamburger sandwich is the exact same look I saw Clark Gable give Ava Gardner in that Magombo picture. Well, unlike you, my boy, I work hard. I get hungry. Order! One burger. Hold the lettuce. Hold the chips. Hold the relish. Hold the pickles. Hold the mustard. Hold the burger. He changed his mind. Boy, I'd hate to run a joint like this. Yeah. Customers drive you down. Hey, Cora, how's our order? It's on the grill, gentlemen. Pitch me the morning paper, would you, Cora? Thanks. I want to look over the stock market quotations. What are you interested in the market for, Doc? Want to see if your mortuary stock is up? <laughs> no, I bought a few shares of consolidated bat fur, preferred. I want to see how the bat fur business is. The bat fur business? What the heck's a bat fur? The clout you over the head with, stupid, and I wish I had one. <laughs> oh, that ain't the corniest old... Teach you not to indulge in repartee with your intellectual superiors, my boy. Huh. Anytime you... Here's your food, gents. <laughs> oh, thanks, Corey. You just saved my life. Me too. There's a hunk coming out of the paper here anyhow, right where I wanted to read. Oh, so I, I tore that out, doctor. If you want to read it, I got it. Oh? It's a column on happy marriages. They got a new marriage counselor down at the Gazette. Yeah? What happened to the old one? Well, she got married and quit writing. Oh. Oh, this new one, though, she makes real good sense. Miss Harriet Ogamist, her name is. Harriet Ogamist, P.H.D. Miss Ogamist, the marriage counselor, huh? I clipped her column out today because it's all about how to make your wife happy, how to be thoughtful and nice. I'm going to take it home and put it where Marvin can see it. <laughs> yeah. Just a subtle hint, huh? Going to paste it on the wall? I haven't decided for sure. I may just keep the column and paste Marvin. <laughs> oh, here's the sugar doctor. Thanks. What's the matter with Marvin? He out of work again? Oh, it isn't that. I'm used to him being out of work, but if he'd read a column like this once in a while instead of that racing form... Uh, here's a napkin, Mr. McGee. Thanks. Like it says in the column, we women don't ask much of our husbands. Just a kind word now and then, that's all. I'm a bachelor myself, so pass the salt, will you? Here you are. Thanks. All we want is a little appreciation, that's all. Just a kind word now and then, a little pat on the back. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right, Cora. Pass me... You're the... a married man, Mr. McGee. Just mm. let me read these six simple rules to you. Mm. Is this too much? Now, look, rule one. Tell your wife she looks pretty when you come home, even if she looks tired and mussed up. Mm, sure, that, that's... Rule good. two. Show her you appreciate her. Give her a pat on the back. She deserves it. Oh, sure she does. Now, yeah. rule three. Smile when you come in. Don't forget she's had a hard day, too. She doesn't expect you to bring her a mink coat. But you can raise her temperature with a warm smile in any kind of weather. Oh, that's fine, Cora. Ain't it, Doc? That stuff is right, right? You don't have to stop eating, just nod your head. Uh, certainly it's right. A lot of very good advice for a married man in that column, my boy. Pass the ketchup, will you? I don't know why I'm reading this stuff to you, Mr. McGee. Oh, you're probably very sweet and thoughtful to your wife. But, oh, wait till I get home tonight and get a hold of that crumb Marvin. Well, I guess a lot of husbands When don't... I put Marvin's dinner on the table tonight, I'm going to give him one last chance. If he doesn't smile and give me a pat on the back, I'm going to give him a pat on the head with the flat side of the meat cleaver. Wow. I'll show... Hey, i got to get to work. <laughs> Boy, she really poured it on, didn't she? That husband of hers must be a real clod. Yeah, yeah. You know, Doc, maybe Molly feels the same way about me. Only she just don't say anything. Oh. No, no, I mean it. But I never do thoughtful things like it says in that article. I don't tell her she looks pretty half as much as I should. I don't smile at her much. You know something? I've been a real clod. That's what everyone says. I'm going to pick up a gazette, clip that column, and try it out. Try those rules for a happy marriage on Molly. Eat your lunch. I got no time to eat now. I got things to do. Thoughtful things. I didn't realize it till now, but I've been very unthoughtful. Yeah, but your sandwich... You can have the rest of my sandwich, Ducky. Hey, Cora, give Doc the check. What? I gotta run home and start being thoughtful. My gosh, this Gazette article makes a lot of sense, like Cora said. Women don't want mink coats. All they want is a smile, a pat on the back. Tell them they look pretty. Always be thoughtful and attentive. I've been overlooking that. I've been unthoughtful. Is that you, McGee? Yeah, hi, Molly. I'm in here in the living room, just looking over the news. You go right ahead and read. I'll be in there in a minute. Make sure I got all these points memorized first. I'll start with, tell her she looks pretty when you come home, even if she looks tired and mussed up. Then I'll give her a pat on the back. McGee! Huh? What are you doing? 
Huh? Oh, I, I'm just brushing my feet off good. Yeah, I know how hard you work around the house, and I like to show a little consideration for a swell wife like you are by brushing off my feet and stuff. Oh, well, that's very sweet of you. Yeah, I'll be in in a minute, as soon as I, as soon as I put my shoes back on. Well, here goes. Hi, kiddo. Well, hello. Where you been? N downtown. Had lunch with Doc Gamble. That's nice. Would you like uh, part of the newspaper? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, don't get up, Tootsie. I'll get it. You, uh, y you look very pretty today. Very pretty. Well, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You look real pretty. I like that dress. This thing? Oh, <laughs> it's just an old dress. I know, but, but there's something about you, kiddo. Old dresses just look good on you. I mean, you do something for an old dress. Oh? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, there is something I'd like to do for this one. Give it a pension. Well, it may be old, but on you it looks young. Yes, sir. You, you look real pretty. Well, do you want part of the paper, or are you just going to stand there? Oh, sure. Thanks. So far, so good. Now, let's see what's next. Oh, yeah. Pat her on the back for something she did well today. Well, here goes. Molly, that sure was a swell breakfast you cooked this morning. Swell. <laughs> <coughs> Heavenly days, what are you doing, McGee? Stop that. Well, gee whiz, Molly, I was just... Just what? Pounding a person on the back like that when they're trying to read the paper. My goodness, what's the matter with you? Well, uh, well, there was a fly on your back. Yeah, a fly. A fly? Yeah, but uh, he, he got away. It's okay now. Why don't you sit down over there in that nice, easy chair and read your sports section? I'll spray the room later if there are any flies in here. Sure, sure, kiddo. That's it. I only have a few minutes to look at this fashion page. I have to get dinner soon. You don't mind, do you? Oh, no, no, go ahead. You go right ahead and read your paper. Uh, I don't mind. Good. Hmm. This thing isn't working like I figured. Maybe I ought to forget the whole thing. We women don't ask much of our husbands. Just a kind word now and then. We don't expect you to bring us a mink coat. But you can raise our temperatures with a warm smile in any kind of weather. Certainly it's right, McGee. There's a lot of very good advice for a married man in that column, my boy. Pass the ketchup, will you? Well, if Doc and Cora both agree, I guess I'll give this thing another try. Now, let's see what's next. Oh, yeah. Smile when you come home. Remember, she's had a hard day. Well, here goes. McGee, what are you grinning at? Hmm? I said, what are you grinning at? <laughs> I ain't grinning, kiddo. I'm smiling. Smiling? Yeah, smiling at you to raise your temperature because I can't afford mink. What? Oh, this is ridiculous. What is? <laughs> oh, this whole thing. What whole thing? <laughs> McGee, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Come on, tell me, what's going on here? First you hit me on the back and then you get a silly smile on your face. Not laughing like a hyena. <laughs> Stop waving that newspaper clipping in the air and tell me what this is all about. Well, dearie, even if your idea didn't work, I think it was sweet. Let me see that newspaper column. Here it is. At least you can't say I didn't try. Well, I will admit when you walked in and said I looked pretty, it sent tingles up and down my spine. It did, huh? Yeah. So whoever wrote this article really knows what... Say, wait a minute. Hmm? It says here, tell her she looks pretty, even if she looks tired and must up. Mm-hmm. Must up? You mean I really don't look pretty? You just said that to... Oh, no, kiddo, that, that's just... How many a... times have you done that, McGee? Oh. Said I look pretty when I didn't at all. Well, I just... Now, I appreciate attention and thoughtfulness as much as anyone, well... but I don't want to go walking around downtown with my hat on crooked or a, a rip in my hem. Good night. Or my slip shown just because you won't tell me. I mean, after all... Good night. Oh. Good night, all. <laughs> Fibber McGee and Molly is an NBC Radio Network production transcribed with Arthur Q. Bryan as Dr. Gamble and Elvia Allman as Cora. Say, did you ever get an invitation out to dinner and then forget who it was that invited you? Well, that's what happens to the McGee Sunday night. And if you have any imagination, or if you know the McGees, or both, you can picture the consternation. Hear it for yourself Sunday night on Fibber McGee and Molly. From September 30th, 1954, Fibber, McGee, and Molly, 
right here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The word research has become pretty familiar to all of us in the last 10 years or so, but have you ever stopped to think what research, especially medical research, means to you personally? Without research, we would have no penicillin or any of the other wonder drugs. Research is also the most important weapon in the fight against mental illness. And mental illness today afflicts more than 9 million people. Already, research has opened up leads for preventing many mental illnesses, and research has shown us speedier and more effective ways of helping mentally sick people to get well. Research scientists say we can be hopeful, but they need help from us. They need money to carry on research. If we help science, science can give us a much better chance to escape mental illness and to cure mental illness if it should strike. If you'd like to help, give to the Mental Health Fund in care of your local postmaster. Just address Mental Health Fund in care of your local postmaster. Don't wait. This worthwhile cause needs your support now. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Uh, Please thank this station and support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to keep Classic Radio alive and keep coming to you each time we're here on your favorite station. Miss a day, you don't have to miss a show. All of our Classic Radio Theater shows are available on demand through my webpage, classicradio.stream. That's classicradio.stream. Stream our shows, learn more about classic radio collecting. You can contact me, find our social media links. And if you like our mission of keeping classic radio alive, you can buy me a copy. Yes, we are still finding classic radio collections out there that we do not have or in significantly improved quality. And we acquire those from collectors who want a couple of bucks. So we help them. You help me buy me a coffee. That's where that money goes. Classicradio.stream. Classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.